This is Diagnostic Test Validation Part 3, SPIN and SNOUT. SPIN and SNOUT are acronyms used to describe how tests with either high sensitivity or high specificity can be used to rule out or rule in diseases. In this tutorial, we'll explain what these acronyms mean and we'll show you how to apply them in clinical situations. Let's begin with SNOUT because I like to discuss uh, sensitivity before I discuss specificity. So SNOUT stands for a test with high sensitivity is useful for ruling out. More specifically, in a highly sensitive test, a negative result rules out disease. And let's just do that again. In a highly sensitive test, a negative result rules out disease. Let's go back to the validation sample. In this sample, just like in the other tutorials, we have 50 patients, and 50 of them actually have the disease in question, and 50 of them actually do not have the disease in question. Looking at the people with disease, let's give them a diagnostic test that has a very high sensitivity. So let's say 47 out of 50 people with the disease test positive, and that gives us a sensitivity rate of 94%, which is pretty good. Now I want you to think about why a test might be positive. And to do that, I want you to think of a friend or a family member or a coworker who's extremely sensitive. This person picks up on anything you say if you send them any little signal, if you speak the wrong way, if you do the wrong thing, they're going to get upset with you. And that's what it's like for a very sensitive diagnostic test. Any little signal that the patient has a disease, the test is going to come out positive. Therefore, the majority of people with the disease in question will test positive. Okay. So in this sample, 47 out of 50 people with the disease tested positive and our sensitivity rate was 94%. Now the final three subjects were false negatives, and those are those last three patients we see on the bottom row. Now let's go to a clinical situation. So in the clinic, you have a patient before you, and you do not know whether this patient has a disease or not. So you apply a very sensitive test to this patient. Now, a very sensitive test, as we've said before, really, really wants to come up positive. So any little signal that the patient has a disease, this test is going to be positive. And yet, despite that, this patient actually tests negative. In that case, there is a good chance that the patient actually does not have a disease. A sensitive test wants to be positive. So if the patient tests negative, there's a good chance they do not have the disease. Now let's go back to the validation sample and finish up the test among the people who do not have the disease. In this case, 37 people who did not have a disease tested negative and there were 13 false positives. Now I could have given this test a higher specificity rate. The problem is that if a test is very sensitive, it's likely that some of the people without disease are also going to test positive. So there's going to be a few false positives when a test is very, very sensitive. So here we have a specificity rate of about 74%. If we fill in our 2x2 two two table, this is what it would look like. We have 47 true positives and 3 false negatives. Remember that sensitivity was true positives over true positives plus false negatives. So in a very, very sensitive test, as the number of true positives goes up, the number of false negatives goes down. And therefore, negative results that you do see, 
are more likely to be true negatives. Returning to our 2 by 2 table, we have 3 false negatives and 37 true negatives. So our negative result for this test is more likely, much more likely, to be one of those 37 true negatives than one of those 3 false negatives. Another way to think about this is that even with only a reasonable specificity, this test would result in a pretty low negative likelihood ratio. So remember that the box in the lower left hand corner of our 2x2 two two table where we had three subjects, that's 6% of the 50 subjects and it gives us a 1 minus sensitivity level of 0 0.06 and then remember that 37 out of 50 subjects was our specificity level. The negative likelihood ratio is 1 minus sensitivity over specificity and in this case this works out to 0 0.08. So subjects with the disease were only 0 0.08 times as likely to test negative as subjects without the disease or subjects with the disease were 92% less likely to test negative compared to subjects without the disease. Now let's go to SPIN. SPIN stands for a test with high specificity is good for ruling diseases in. More precisely we could say that in a highly specific test a positive result rules in. And let's do that again in a highly specific test, a positive result rules in. Let's go back to the validation sample and let's give this test a very very high specificity. So in this case 48 out of the 50 people without the disease tested negative and that gives us a specificity rate of 96%. And just like last time, I want you to think of a friend, family member, or coworker. But this time, rather than someone who's very sensitive, I want you to think about someone who's very specific. Someone who's very specific can be thought of someone who's very, very fussy. So someone who's fussy, nothing is good enough for them. Nobody meets the criteria. And that's not good enough. I don't like that one. No, I don't want that one. Well, that's how a highly specific test works. It takes a lot to come up with a positive result. If there's not a very strong signal that the patient has the disease, this test is going to come up negative. So in this case, we have 48 people out of 50 without the disease, who test negative. And again, that's a specificity rate, excuse me, of 96%. Now let's finish this off. And then the final two people test positive. So these would be false positives. And let's think about what this means clinically. In the clinic, you have a patient and you do not know whether they have the disease or not. And you apply a highly specific test now, as we said, this test really, really wants to be negative. It takes a really strong signal for this test to come up positive. And yet, this patient still tests positive. Well, then chances are this patient has the disease. So a really specific test wants to be negative. So if the test comes up positive, there's a good chance the patient has the disease. Now returning back to our full sample, we'll give this test a reasonable level of sensitivity and we have 40 out of 50 people with the disease testing positive. So that's a sensitivity rate that's decent but not amazing. So that's 80 percent sensitivity. And let's go to our 2 by 2 table. In our 2 by 2 table, we have 40 true positives and two false positives. 
remember that specificity was true negatives over true negatives plus false positives. And so as the number of true negatives goes up, as it does with a highly specific test, the number of false positives goes down. Therefore, when you do see a positive result, it is unlikely to be a false positive. Going back to our 2x2 two two table, remember we had 40 true positives and 2 false positives. And so if you have a positive result, it's much more likely to be one of those 40 than just one of those 2. It can happen, but it's unlikely. Remember also that 40 out of 50 was our sensitivity rate, and 2 out of 50 was 1 minus specificity. So when you take these two numbers, we come up with our positive likelihood ratio, which is sensitivity over 1 minus specificity, and in this case, it's 20. So even with only a decent level of sensitivity, in this case, someone who has the disease is 20 times more likely to test positive than someone without the disease. So if you're having trouble understanding this content, it always makes sense to go back to the 2x2 two two table and think about true positives, true negatives, false negatives, and false positives, and put things in context. And of course, there are always the usual cautions. No free lunch with spin and snout either. Remember, spin and snout are based on sensitivity and specificity. And so we have all the same problems. Sometimes we lack a good gold standard. Sometimes the estimates vary between patient populations and test characteristics when they shouldn't. And finally, as prevalence gets really high or really low, strange things start to happen. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next tutorial, positive and negative predictive values. So remember that when you consider these limitations, when you have an actual patient in front of you, you should consider a variety of factors, not just the diagnostic test results. You need to consider very carefully the patient's individual characteristics, the history, the findings from your physical exam. And then if you have a test with either high sensitivity or specificity, but not the other, you'll probably need at least two tests to complement each other. And even then, these tests are not foolproof. I hope you found this informative, and we'll explain some of the limitations further in the next tutorial.